Hey, hey, Dr. Ray here, founder of The Learning Liaisons, and welcome. Welcome to our Wednesday evening math sessions featuring our math specialist and your math specialist, Amy Sink. In the next hour, Amy has put together a sample set of approximately 10 practice questions that run the gamut from kindergarten levels all the way through 12th grade high school math. Now, I know you are attending here watching this and you're like, well, I'm doing elementary in Texas or I'm doing elementary in Praxis or I'm doing high school math in Florida or middle school math in Texas and pra what's going on here, right? So we're doing these sessions to help you guys out and provide you with different ways to look at problems and to build that confidence. Because here at The Learning Liaisons, our, one of our major objectives is to clear up the testing confusion, give you the support you deserve in order to nail your exam and be done with it. So our focus is on math. Now, are we going to be just focusing on high school math the whole hour or elementary? No, we've got a mixture here. Now, Amy is gonna go through a bunch of problems. You're gonna have the opportunity to download those as a PDF. So when Amy starts, just pay attention to the screen. We're gonna have a message there for you so you can download the PDF in case we don't get to all the problems we wanna practice on your own. She's gonna do her best to go across all different grade levels. If you have a question, you feel free to ask Amy your question as well. Uh, we're teachers here too, so we can multitask. Our job is to make sure that we give you what you need to be successful. But if you're like, ah, oh, dang it, I didn't have any questions this week. Don't worry, we'll be here next Wednesday night as well. So bring those questions with you if you want and you can ask Amy away. Because here at The Learning Liaisons, we pride ourselves in providing you guys the support you need to pass your exam. So whether you're our Florida teachers here with our FTC exams, our national exam, Praxis Peeps, big shout out to you guys out there too. And especially our newcomers to The Learning Liaisons brand, Texas Prep. So whether you're elementary, middle school and high school, we've got your back. So. Sit back, relax, grab your popcorn, get ready to learn some math, and stay tuned for the end because I'm gonna jump back on to close this out, and I got a special surprise for you guys who really wanna get the real deal prep and get everything you need to be successful and practice, clear up that confusion, and pass your certification exam on the next attempt. So, welcome to the Learning Liaisons community. Always remember, it's when you pass, not if you pass. So without further ado, let's turn it over to the reason why you're here, Amy. You with us, Amy? Let's get going. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Night Math Night. I am so excited to be here with you. As you know, I'm Amy Sink, and I am one of the math specialists here at the Learning Liaisons, and we are just here to help you, like Dr. A said. So we are here every Wednesday to just help you Feel more confident with the, the math exams and the math problems. These math exams are not easy, y'all. And so we recognize that and we want to be able to help you out. So we are here every Wednesday. I always like to ask, like, what do you want help with? Because these sessions are for you. So as we're working through problems, think about what you want help with so that I can tailor these sessions to you. This week, we've got some probability problems, some word problems, a ratio problem, because last week, specifically, people asked for help with those specific areas, and so that's what's included this week. Um, before we get started, I always like to do, to do a get to know you, so in the comment box, let me know where you're from, what test are you prepping for, and <clears throat> what's your favorite kind of music? I just randomly thought of that question because I have an ABCD shirt that's kind of like ACDC. Um, and so it made me think of music types. So what's your favorite kind of music? I love country music and I love like, I don't know, like mid 2000, like 2010, like techno rap music. I know it's a really specific genre, but I love it. So where are you from? What, what test are you prepping for? And what is your favorite kind of music? Um, and we are going to go ahead and get started. Now, tonight we're going to kind of get started with a little, it's going to look a little different um, because I cannot find my iPad anywhere. I'm pretty sure the baby probably picked it up and put it somewhere. 
Um, so we're gonna do good old fashioned paper and pencil with the with the slides on the screen. So here's our slides, and then I'm gonna solve it on paper and pencil. Sound good? All right, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna make myself a little bigger just so that you can see what I'm actually doing. And the slide is gonna be a little bit smaller tonight. All righty. An individual was wrapping a rectangular prism shaped box that has a lid. The box measured seven inches by nine inches by 10 inches. If the person wraps the box using one sheet of rectangular shaped wrapping paper that measured four feet by five feet with no gaps or overlapping paper, how many square inches of wrapping paper are left over? Who, y'all, that is a really, really thick problem. There is a lot happening there. Hey, Susanna, it is good to see you from North Carolina, Praxis 7813 and Country Music. We are actually um, going to a wedding here in a little bit, and we are going to a wedding in Alabama, and we bought my baby some, like, boots, and they're the cutest things ever. They're, like, legit country boots um, or cowboy boots, and we're so excited. All right. Anyways, um, this problem is really, really thick with words. So the first thing that I always do, and I always like to highlight and annotate, but we're going to work with what we have, is I like to draw what I'm working with. And so this says that an individual was working or wrapping a rectangular prism. So I'm going to draw that rectangular prism here so I can visualize what we are working with. And this prism has, is measuring seven inches by nine inches, by 10 inches. Now, where you put that seven, that nine, and that 10 really don't matter because multiplication is commutative. And so it can really happen in any order. Now, I caution you on finding the volume instead of the surface area. Volume is area of your base times the height of the shape in this case, area of the base is length times width. So the volume of a rectangular prism is going to be length times width times height. But that tells me how many cubes can go inside of it. That does not tell me how much wrapping paper can wrap around this rectangular shaped box that has a lid. The box is seven by nine by 10, and then there's a lid, and they wanna know how much um, wrapping paper is left over because they are wrapping the box. They're not wrapping the box and the lid, they're only wrapping the box. So I have to figure out what I'm working with here. So the paper measures four feet by five feet, but this is, uh, but this is in feet, and this is in inches. And so when I'm working with this, I have to recognize that I can't just take this and then wrap the box and figure out how much is left over. I have to make sure that I am accounting for the fact that this is measuring in linear inches and this is measuring in linear feet. So I am going to convert this first. So how do I convert feet to inches? Well, I know that one foot equals 12 inches. So then if I'm trying to figure out five feet and four feet, I can do four feet equals blank inches and five feet equals blank inches. How did I get from one foot to 12 inches? Did I multiply by something or did I divide by something? When I go from one number to another number, I'm trying to figure out, did I multiply or divide? One times 12 or one divided by 12? I did one times 12 to go this way. So I'm gonna do 
four times 12 to go this way and five times 12. I'm gonna plug that in my handy dandy calculator. Four times 12 is 48. And five times 12 is 60. So I know that this piece of wrapping paper is 48 inches by 60 inches. And when I find the area of that, that's going to tell me how many square inches I'm working with, which is going to tell me how many square inches I have to wrap this box. So 48 times 60 is 2,880. That's how much wrapping paper I have. Now I need to figure out how much I am wrapping. So when I look at this, I want to think about what shapes I have. I have this rectangle right here. And that rectangle has dimensions 7 by 10. I have this rectangle right here, which has dimensions 10 by 9. And then I have this top rectangle up here, which has dimensions seven by nine. So the area of each of these rectangles is going to be nine times seven, which is 63, 10 times seven, which is 70, and 10 times nine, which is 90. But now what? Now I have each of the rectangles. I have how much wrapping paper I have. So what am I going to do now? I need to subtract the amount of wrapping paper I need for the box from the amount of wrapping paper I have. So I know that I have two of these, two of these, and two of these. And I'm gonna get back to the whole lid conversation in a minute. So let's just roll with it. So the square footage or square inches of this rectangle times two is 126. 70 times two is 140. And 90 times two is 180. What did I just figure out? I just figured out the area of two of these rectangles. And these are like the side rectangles. I just figured out the area of two of these rectangles, which is like the front and the back side. And I just figured out the area of two of these rectangles, which is the nine by seven, which is that bottom and the top piece. So now I need to add all of those together to get a total surface area of my box. So 126 plus 140 plus 180 equals 446. That is the surface area of my box. Now I take how much wrapping paper I have, subtract it from the amount here, and that's going to give me my answer. So 2,880 2, minus 446 equals 2,000, and I'm going to write it over here. 2,434, which is C. That's my answer. Now, let's chat about that lid. At the beginning of the problem, I said that it didn't matter where you put those numbers because multiplication is commutative, which is correct. However, it does matter where those numbers are when I'm trying to figure out if I need to wrap the top or the lid or if I don't need to wrap the lid. So in this case, we wrapped the lid because it was not specific. And that's, I wrote this problem, so that's my fault. 
I was not specific with where the like length, width, and height are, which would totally make a difference. If this is the lid, then I'm going to have 63 square inches not needed. But if this is the lid, that would be 70. And if this was the lid, that would be 90. So that would make a big difference in how this problem plays out. And it did not say, so we wrapped the lid, whatever. Um, and the answer was there. But moving forward, like when we think about a box with a lid, we have to pay attention to, are we wrapping the lid or are we not? And we, where are those dimensions? So I just want you to process and think about that when you're solving a problem like this. Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and move on to problem number two. How does the mean compare with the median of the data listed below. The median is greater than the mean. The mean is greater than the median. The median and the mean have the same value. Or the data, oh, excuse me, the data does not have a mean. All right, so let's chat about excuse me, mean, median, mode, and range. Mean, median, mode, and range. The mean is going to be your average. You're adding all your numbers up and then you're dividing by the amount of data points you have. It's called the mean because it makes us do the most work. Urgh, it's so mean. The median is the middle of your data. So it's like the median of a road is the middle of the road. The median of your data is the middle of your data. The mode of your data is the most appearing piece of data that we see. So it's the one that appears the most. And then the range is just the difference between your highest and your lowest data point. So when we look at this, they are only asking us about the mean and the median. So I'm going to solve for the mean first. So I'm going to add all my data points up and then I'm going to divide by the number of data points. So I'm just going to write them down and then I'll turn the camera around. Five plus eight plus three plus six plus two plus six plus four plus eight plus nine plus ten. All right. So this is what I have. I have all of my data points written down. Five plus eight plus three plus six plus two plus six plus four plus eight plus nine plus ten. And then I'm going to divide that, hence the big division symbol, by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, because there's 10 data points here. And that's going to equal, now I'm going to type that in my calculator, and anytime I do mean, I always type it twice, because I want to make sure that I don't have like a key error, because there's so many data values. So. 5 plus 8 plus 3 plus 6 plus 2 plus 6 plus 4 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10. I got 61 divided by 10. But I'm going to do it again just to make sure. 5 plus 8 plus 3 plus 6 plus 2 plus 6 plus 4 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10. 61. And then I'm going to divide that by 10. And that equals 6.1. That is the mean. That is the mean. Now I'm going to find my median. It didn't ask us for the mode or the range, so I'm going to find my median, the middle of the data. Now, how do I find the middle of the data? I have to put them in order. I have to put them in chronological order. If I don't, then it's not my true middle. So I have to put them in order from least 
to greatest, and then I can find my median. So let's go ahead and put them in order from least to greatest. So I have a two, a three, a four, a five, two sixes, two eights, a nine, and a 10. Now I'm gonna count them to make sure I have 10 data points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I'm not missing anybody. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cross them off side by side until I get to the middle. So, crossing it off. Three, three, four, four, five, five. Uh oh. Does that mean that there's no median because we crossed everything off and there wasn't anything in the middle? Does that mean we don't have a median? No, it does not. It means that the median is just the number that's between the two numbers that we crossed off. So let's look at that again. I did, I'm trying to find them, two and 10, three and nine, four and eight, five and eight, and then six and six were together. So in this case, it's kind of easy because what's between six and six? Six, so six is my median. Now, if this was like a six and an eight, then my median would be seven because in between six and eight is seven. If this was a six and a seven, my median would be six and a half because between six and seven is six and a half. If this was like six and 10, my median would also be eight. So like you see where I'm going, but if I cross off the numbers and then I have one left in the middle, that's my median. So now that I know that my median is six and my mean is 6.1 what does that tell me now i can read my statements and figure it out the median is greater than the mean the mean is greater than the median the median and mean have the same value the data does not have a median. Well, we know that the data has a median, so that's out. However, is the median greater than the mean? Or is the mean greater than the median? Or do they have the same value? The mean is greater than the median, which is B. So B is our answer. If you are just joining us, welcome to Wednesday Night Math Night. Paper and smelly Mr. Sketch um, pen edition. My iPad is lost. So this is what we're doing. Um, but I wish that TV and video had like multiple dimensions because if you could smell this marker, Y'all, it smells so good. This one is blueberry flavored and it is absolutely delicious. If you've never invested in a Mr. Sketch Marker, you've got to do it. Mr. Sketch Markers literally write the best and they smell the best. They smell so incredibly good. All right, let's move on to problem number three. In a bag, there are five red trucks, three blue trucks, two green trucks, and eight white trucks. If a truck is randomly chosen from the bag, what is the probability that it is green or blue? If a truck is randomly chosen from the bag, what is the probability that it is green or blue? All right, new page, ready. All right, so 
I'm going to write the word probability without doing it upside down, and then we'll chat about what probability is. Probability. Woo! Probability is the desire over the total possible outcomes. And that was a lot of words, which is why I'm not writing it upside down. This poor pen, I've had it for years and it's starting to go out. Probability is the desire out of the total possible outcomes. So when we look at this problem, we need to think about what is my desire? My desire is to have a green or a blue truck. And what is my <clears throat> total possible outcomes? My total possible outcomes is the number of trucks that are in my bag, no matter what. So the total possible outcomes is going to be the number of trucks. So that is going to be five plus three plus two plus eight, because that is the total number of trucks that I have. My desire is to have a truck that is green or blue. So I'm going to be okay if I pull a green truck out of the bag, but I'm also going to be okay if I pull a blue truck out of the bag. So I am okay with green or blue, which would be two plus three. So two plus three is five. Five plus three. 3 plus 2 plus 8, 8 plus 2 is 10, 10 plus 8 is 18. So 5 out of 18 is D. Now, what if they said, what is the probability that I get a green truck? Green would just be 2 out of 18 because my desire is only green, which would be the 2. And I still have 18 trucks in my bag. But what if they said, what is, the, what is the probability that I pull out a green truck, put it in my pocket, and then pull out a blue truck? Well, when we have combined probability like that, I'm going to do the probability of the first event times the probability of that second event. So if I pull out the green truck, which would be 2 out of 18, and I put it in my pocket, how many trucks are left in the bag for my second probability? Only 17. Because I pulled the truck and I did not replace it back in the bag. So that is a, that's vocabulary that I really need you to understand because that is something that's common that they'll do is they'll look at replacement or non-replacement. So if I pull the green truck out and I put it back, then I still have 18 trucks in the bag. But if I pull a green truck out and I put it in my pocket, I don't have 18 trucks anymore. So my total possible outcomes for that second event is going to be less. Does that make sense? All right, let's move on to problem number four. Now, if you are watching and you have the ability to comment, comment in the comment box and let me know, what do you wanna see from me in the upcoming weeks? Like, what are you really, really struggling with? Let me know in the comments. That is why we are here, to help with the stuff that you need help with. I can make up problems all day, but if I'm doing it for problems that you need, that makes these sessions 10 times better. All right. Oh my goodness, y'all, this problem is so good. All right, I was really excited when I made this. If X equals seven and Y is 18 less than three times X and Z is the quotient of 12 and Y, what is the value of X plus Y minus Z? Hi, Lydia. Hi, Jen. Hi, Francis. It's good to see you guys. All right. Before I get started with this problem, still struggling with fractions. Lydia, so many people struggle with fractions because when we were taught fractions, we were taught that they were these scary, scary numbers that like don't follow the rules and all this stuff. Fractions are just numbers. 
<coughs> on a number line. They just have, they behave a little bit differently, but they're just numbers on a number line. And when we shift our perspective about fractions, it helps us understand them just a little bit better. But I will absolutely include some fraction problems. GK math, all of it. Honestly, Jen, unless I verbally say this problem is for high school only, you can pretty much guarantee that anything I do on a Wednesday night could be on GK, unless I say this is for high school only. Because GK encompasses elementary, middle, and early high school math. And so the GK is really encompassed by everything we do on Wednesdays, which is kind of good. Um, examples of student error problems, Praxis 7813. Student errors. You got it. Um, hi, Francis. All right, let's go ahead and solve this problem. If x equals seven and y is, this is a lot of words, but it's really not that hard, y'all. So when I go to the question, I'm going to go to the question. What is x plus y minus z? Ooh, that is not a z. Writing upside down is real. All right. X plus Y minus Z. I already know X is seven. So I'm going to put a seven there plus Y minus Z. Backwards Z because I'm doing it upside down. So I already replaced the seven and then I'm just going to add the Y and subtract the Z. Now I have to look at that statement about Y and that statement about Z and solve it. So Y is y equals 18 less than. If you have done anything with me when we transition words into numerical phrases or ex expressions, you have heard me say this before. 18 less than is not 18 minus. I'm going to say that again. 18 less than is not 18 minus. Let me give you an example. What is three less than eight? If you said five, you're correct. You're absolutely correct. What is three less than eight? Three less than eight. Three smaller than eight is five. But I did not do three minus eight to figure that out. What did I do? Eight minus three. So three less than eight is eight minus three, something minus three. So 18 less than is something minus 18. And it's 18 less than what? It's 18 less than what? 18 less than three times X. Three X. And Z. I don't need to keep reading. I'm going to finish the Y and then I'll go to the Z. So three times X minus 18. Well, three times X is three times seven because X is seven. Three times seven is 21 minus 18. And 21 minus 18 is three. So now I can plug in a three for Y. So I have seven plus three minus whatever Z is. Seven plus three is 10. And now I'm gonna do 10 minus something to get my final value. Well, what is that Z value? That Z value is the quotient of, what does quotient mean? This is a vocabulary rich problem, which if you don't know your vocabulary, you're really gonna struggle with this problem. What does the quotient mean? The quotient is the answer to a division problem. So I know that I'm doing division. Am I doing 12 divided by Y or am I doing Y divided by 12? That's important. 
when I'm doing the quotient of, I'm doing the quotient of blank, that divided by that, like it goes in order. So it's not as confusing as 18 less than. So the quotient of 12 and y, z equals 12 divided by y, easy peasy. Y is three. So I'm gonna do 12 divided by three. What is 12 divided by three? Four. So seven plus three, minus four. You know what the most common silly mistake people are going to make? They're going to do seven plus three plus four because their brain is just going to read right through that and it's going to read right through that subtraction symbol. Don't make that mistake because you just did all of this work. You certainly don't want to get the problem wrong because you read the subtraction symbol wrong, right? So seven plus three is ten. 10 minus 4 is 6. So my answer is C, 6. Questions about that? All right, let's move on to problem number 5. A group of friends is planning a road trip. They decide to split the cost of gas proportionally to the distances they will be traveling. Sarah will be driving 300 miles, John 450 miles, and Emily 600 miles. If they want to split the cost in a ratio that corresponds to the distances they are traveling, how much should John contribute if the total gas is 120? All right. So the first thing I'm going to think about when I'm reading this problem is what are they asking me? Because what I don't want to do is do a bunch of work that doesn't match what they're asking me. So let me find a blank page. They are asking me, for John. So I am going to write John's name at the top of my paper so that I remember what I'm solving for. Because what I don't want to do is do a bunch of work that's unnecessary. This right here could be a ratio problem. It could also not be a ratio problem. It really depends on how you view it. So I'm going to solve this problem two different ways because I want you to see how I naturally solved this problem, but I also want you to see how to solve it using ratios. So a group of friends is planning a road trip. They decide to split the cost of the gas proportionally to the distances they will be traveling. Sarah will be traveling 300 miles, John 450 and Emily 600. You wanna know where my brain went? My brain thought, what percentage did Sarah drive, which is going to equal the percentage of gas that she drove, that she is buying. What percentage did John buy, which is going to equal the percentage that John is paying in gas? So I can figure that out by writing a fraction to represent this. Lydia, Everybody else who needs fractions, this is for you. It doesn't look like fractions, but it really is. And remember how we've talked about, if you've been with me at all, if not, welcome to math with me, how fractions, decimals, percentages, and ratios are all part of a family. You're going to see that really clearly today. So I'm going to do John, which is 450 miles out of a total, a total. And I need to figure out what that total is. So John's part is 450 out of the total number of miles. Well, let's go ahead and add those miles up. Total miles is 300 plus 450 plus 600. The total is 1,350. So that is his part out of the total trip. 
Well, when I plug that into my calculator, I'm going to get 450 divided by 1,350.333 repeating, which equals 33.3%. So he drove 33.3%. Now, if I multiply $120 times the decimal version of the percentage, it will tell me how much John needs to pay. It's going to tell me what is 33% of 120 times 120, $40 on the dot. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. When I first solved this problem, I figured out the amount for everybody. I wrote Sarah. I wrote John. I wrote Emily. And then I finished and I said, why did I just do all that work? That was kind of silly of me. I want you to really focus on only doing the work that you need to do. I didn't need to figure out how much Sarah's paying and how much Emily's paying. I only needed to figure out what John was paying. Now, let me show you how to set up a ratio for that. A ratio or like a proportion is set up by putting two things equal to each other. So I want John over total to equal John over total. When I set up a proportion, I have to have the same things equal to each other. So this is going to be John's distance. And this one is going to be John's gas money. But it's still going to be John's part out of the total part. So we already know that for distance, John's part is 450. The total part is 1350. We already know that. So I'm going to go ahead and put John out of total. And then that's going to equal John's part of the gas money. And what is the total gas money? 120. Now I can cross multiply to figure this out. I can do 450 times 120, and I can do J times 1350. So I'm going to do 450 times 120 equals 1350 times J. Cross multiplication, that's all that is. And solve. 450 times 120 equals 54,000 equals 1,350J. Divide both sides by 1,350, and I still get 40. So regardless of whether I use this side or this side, doesn't matter you're going to get the same answer. But I really wanted to show you that relationship because ratios, percents, decimals, and fractions are all interrelated. And understanding that relationship is going to be really, really helpful for you as you solve these kinds of problems. Questions about this one? All right, let's move on to the next one. We're going to skip number six because we've already done something like that. And I'm going to skip to something that is for my high school people. So I promised you that like I would tell you GK people if it wasn't for you. GK people, this one's not for you. I'm going to do a quick high school one and then we'll kind of go back into something that's a little bit more appropriate for everybody. But I got to hit my high school people. What is cosine of theta in the right triangle? below. 9 out of 15, 15 out of 9, 12 out of 15, or 9 out of 12. All right. High school people, you got to know your right triangle relationships. You got to know your sine, cosine, and tangent relationships. And this is going to be easy peasy for you if you do. So 
because I know that this is a right triangle, I'm going to draw it and then show you. Here's my right triangle, right? And here's theta. I know that cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse because I know that the relationships for sine, cosine, and tangent in a right triangle are so ka toa. To this day, I still say that chant. So ka toa. So ka. Okay, I'm done. Now, sine. This, all this says is sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine of theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent of theta equals opposite over adjacent. So if I'm operating with cosine, then I'm looking at adjacent over hypotenuse. So looking at theta, adjacent is here. Hypotenuse is here. So adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, problem. Adjacent is not on here. So how do I figure that out? GK people, you can come back because what you do have to know is the Pythagorean theorem. So you may not need to know sine, cosine, and tangent, but you do need to know Pythagorean theorem. And Pythagorean theorem says a squared plus b squared equals c squared which is leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. Hypotenuse is always, always, always going to be C. So I'm going to do 9 squared plus B squared equals 15 squared. Why did I do B here and not 15 here? Because 15 is across from the 90 degree angle. 15 is across from the 90 degree angle. And so that makes it C. So I need to find B. 9 squared is 81 plus B squared equals 15 squared. Don't have that one memorized. Two twenty five. B squared equals 225 minus 81, which is 144. Square root both sides. And B equals 12. So all I did was 9 squared is 81. 15 squared is 225. I subtracted 81 from both sides to get B squared by itself. B squared is by itself. And 225 minus 81 is 144. Square root both sides because the opposite or the inverse of a square is a square root. So B equals 12. Now, easy peasy lemon squeezy, adjacent over hypotenuse, adjacent is 12, hypotenuse is 15. So my answer is C, 12 over 15. Not bad. All right, questions about that. Questions about that. No. All right. Let's go ahead and we'll go back to this one and then we'll be done for tonight. After the first 35 games in their season, a professional team has won 80% of their games. If there are 47 games left to play, if there are 47 games left to play, what is the minimum number of games the of remain <coughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> what is the minimum number of remaining games the team must win to finish the season with a win percentage of at least 75%? All right, this is an interesting problem because there's so many layers to it. 
This is an interesting problem because there's so many layers to it. So after the first 35 games, they've won 80%. So I need to figure out first, how many games have they won so far? That's easy. 35 times 80%. But how do I plug or chunk 80% into my calculator? 0.8. I have to convert this percent into a decimal by hop hopping that decimal place. So I'm going to do 35 times 0 0.80 and that equals 28 games won. And I'm going to label this because there are a lot of steps to this problem. Then they said there are 47 games left to play. What is the minimum number of remaining games that the team must win to finish with a winning percentage of 75%? Well, what I need to do is figure out how many games in all do they need to win to have a win percentage of 75%, which I would do by figuring out how many games they're playing total and multiply by that 75%. So total games is going to be 35 plus 47. 35 plus 47 is 82. They are playing a total of 82 games times 75%. And when I convert that into a decimal, 0.75. So 82 times 0.75 equals 61.5. Stop and pause. 61.5. Can I win a half of a game? No. So in order to win at least 75% of my games, this number is, the games is going to have to be bigger than 61 and a half. So they need to win 62 games total. But there's 47 games left. How many of the 47 games do they need to win to get to 62? Well, 62 minus what they've already won. 62 minus 28 is 34. So out of the 47 games that they've already won, or no, out of the 47 games they have left to play, they need to win 34 of them to have a 75% chance, 75% win percentage. Does that make sense? That's a complex problem, but that is a really, really cool multi-step problem that I guarantee you is GK all day. It's middle school math all day. In fact, it could even be that early or that like late elementary, early middle school percentages all day. All right. Well, today was kind of interesting trying to do it on blue, on paper with a blue smelly marker. It worked. And I absolutely love spending my Wednesday nights with you. Yes, absolutely, Lydia. I will show it just like this. This is 62 minus 28. Cheese. And I am going to turn it back over to Dr. A. I will see you all next week. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And we will see you next week. All right, so wasn't that an amazing session? Now, I know, depending on what exam you have to take, you're like, man, that was great, but she didn't address everything I needed. She focused on all different questions that I just need elementary, or I just need middle school, I just need high school. Don't worry. Since you're still with us, I've got a special surprise for you. If you use the coupon code, all capital letters, SYNC35, that's S I N K. Three five. That will take off 35% of any of our prep courses on our website at The Learning Liaisons. It doesn't have to be math. It could be anything that you need that we offer. And this is going to be an ongoing deal for you guys who attend these live sessions because 
These are great. I'm sure Amy opened your eyes to some new concepts, some new ways to tackle problems, building that confidence. But this is just a smidget of your exam, the concepts on your test. So if you want the comprehensive view with the practice with Amy, with the practice test, with the lessons and the, and the content review, we've got your back on our video boot camps, which all of them feature Amy Sink, your math specialist. So if you want to take advantage of that, the code is SYNC35. You can use that at checkout on the learningliaisons.com website. And all that information is on our website as well and on the bottom of the screen in this video. So we are here to help you. Once again, always remember, it's when you pass, not if you pass. Thank you for joining us again today. And hopefully we'll see you next week too. Talk to you soon.